Great. Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, and, and Doug, uh, thank you for the, uh, the history uh, and an update on the, the great work that is being done by the Community Foundation, something that's incredibly important uh, to the work that we all do. Um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Mark Armstrong. I'm the Director of Government Affairs uh, for Ohio's Electric Cooperatives uh, and Buckeye Power. Uh, I have the honor to uh, introduce uh, our next guest who came, uh, flew out this morning from, from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Uh, Asim Haq uh, is here with us this morning, um, and I'm, I'm thrilled to, to introduce him. Um, I think we're going to hear uh, a lot of the same thing that, that we've been talking about. It's going to be great to hear it uh, from, uh, from uh, Asim at, at PJM. Um, so there was a report that was issued earlier uh, this year from PJM that uh, really hits on a lot of the things that we've been talking about, so I'll let him expand on that uh, in his remarks. But a little bit of background um, on Asim. Uh, Asim is the, uh, the vice president. Uh, at, he oversees uh, state government policy, state policy solutions, and member services at PJM Interconnection. Uh, which is the regional transmission organization that coordinates the movement of wholesale electricity in all or part of 13 states from the eastern seaboard across Pennsylvania, Ohio, and, and parts of uh, Indiana, Michigan, uh, and the Chicago land area of, of, of Illinois, including the District of Columbia. Uh, Hawk leads PJM's policy development and interaction with state government, which includes state commissions, governor's offices, state legislatures, and state security agencies. Hawk also oversees PJM's member interactions, which includes the PJM stakeholder process. Prior to joining PJM, Hawk was chairman of the Public Utilities Commission right here in Ohio. As the state's chief regulator, he guided Ohio through some of the most relevant energy policy issues facing the nation, including clean power plan compliance, uh, rates related to the future of baseload power, plants and competitive markets and distribution grid modernization. Um, I recall having a very good relationship uh, with the PCO when, when Asim was, uh, was chair. Uh, Co-ops didn't want to be regulated and PCO didn't want to regulate us, uh, so that worked out uh, to be a, a, a very good uh, relationship. Uh, Hawk is an attorney and uh, prior to his career uh, at a large uh, general practice firm. Uh, he went on to work uh, as an in-house counsel uh, for Honda of America and uh, prior to his appointment to the PCO. Hawk holds a bachelor's degree in chemistry and political science from Case Western Reserve University and a Juris Doctor from The Ohio State University uh, Moritz College of Law. Please uh, help me welcome back to the state of Ohio, Asim Hawk. Good afternoon. Thank you for the very, very kind introduction there. My name is Asim Haq. Uh, again, I am the Vice President of State Policy and Member Services at PJM Interconnection and a Ohio native born and raised in Columbus and moved to the greater Philadelphia area uh, pre-COVID, um, March of 2019. Um, miss my Buckeye football Saturdays for sure, that's a bummer. Um, but we, uh, you know, we're we're ba we're a basketball family um, as well as a football family. So, adding the you know the Sixers and Villanova basketball, that's been a fun addition to our world. But still, very much miss my Buckeye football Saturdays. I'll come back for a few uh, this fall. So we are going to be talking about reliability amidst an energy transition. You know, if you're a sort of policy guy like me, I remember when I was at the commission, you know, Columbus Business First called me a policy wonk. And I guess that there is some truth to that. I really enjoy operating in the policy space, trying to figure out what the sort of right dynamic is um, within a scientific field to deal with, you know, government and craft policies that are sensible. You know, right now we're struggling. It's a real struggle. It's a real tug of war between, you know, typical pillars of the electricity space in particular, you know, reliability, affordability, which I still think are, you know, when I was a regulator, was a combination of safety, reliability, and affordability. But, 
you know, reliability, affordability on the bulk side. Then you've got climate, and you've got climate-related policy that has really found its way into the nation's um, energy conversation. And so we are in an energy transition, and I'll explain to you why that's the case. But where PJM is positioned right now is we are expressing sort of our scientific and analytically backed concerns around the energy transition and being able to maintain reliability during the transition. So let's just begin with the very basics. So this is sort of the basics of a diagram that expresses the basics of power delivery. And we exist on the bulk side. So we <clears throat> oversee uh, in relative real time um, with the coordination of all the good folks that we work with in this room and otherwise, uh, the generation of a watt and then the high voltage transmission of that watt. That watt then finds itself to a distribution substation where then um, it is um, outside then of federal and then RTO jurisdictions, then you know, what is effectively um, either um, locality or PUCO or regulated distribution utility or distribution utility muni co-op who then distributes that power to consumers. But we exist on the bulk system side. So again, generation and high voltage transmission of a watt. Our primary focus is reliability. So we've got you know, a few different you know, very important facets uh, that PJM oversees, but at the end of the day, everything feeds up into this concept of trying to maintain reliability for the 65 million consumers in the PJM footprint. We accomplish that through really three core business functions. And those three core functions are system planning, which many of you know quite a bit about. So regional transmission planning uh, is one major business function at PJM Interconnection. We also have system operations, and you know, if you haven't had the opportunity to come to Valley Forge and see the control room. I know you're well represented in Valley Forge um, through you know, various organizations, but um, if you ever wanna come see that you know, bulk system control room operations, I'd be happy to have you. It's really you know, amazing watching these um, operators work, trying to match you know, supply and demand in real time. Finally, markets. So. Uh, we have a series of markets, short-term and long-term markets. We have real-time markets, and we have three-year forward-looking markets that are meant to procure resource adequacy in um, deregulated jurisdictions like Ohio. Again, though, all of those items feed into that concept of, once again, reliability. So we are a public utility in sort of quotation marks, we are a public utility as defined in the Federal Power Act. And so we are actually fully regulated by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, but we are, you know, um, you know we are not, and this is a presentation typically, you know, or a distinction that would be typically relevant to when I do, uh, for instance, state legislative testimony. You go into a state legislature, Kind of like, who are you guys? Um, and you know, one distinction that I have to make is, even though we are quote a public utility, you know, we effectively operate as a um, not-for-profit entity. How do we operate in that sort of same sphere? Um, we uh, we have a filed rate with the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Um, we have our budget determined on an annual basis. Um, we uh, adhere to that budget. If we come in under budget, that money then gets returned back to members, which uh, if you've got a consumer on the back end of your membership, then back into consumer pockets. But we don't have shareholders. We don't have quarterly earnings. Um, I'm not worried about um, it doing the work on a day-to-day -day basis uh, with a concern about what's gonna happen to the share price. Um, which I think is, you know, sort of freeing um, to be a little more mission-driven 
um, not having to be concerned about uh, what happens financially. Uh, let's go to the next slide. <clears throat> the value proposition. And so you just think about the ability to utilize regional scale. So if you've got, you're effectively going to be able to to take 14 jurisdictions, and PJM actually began in 1927 as a power pool. So a few utilities got together and said, you know what would be a lot more effective um, than everybody building out their own systems, including their generation fleet, um, is to you know potentially share resources. And sort of that's the genesis of PJM. And that, that um, regional scale is what helps create the value proposition. Um, and so we have you know, bucketed out what those uh, numbers could conceivably look like, um, and the value proposition, generally speaking, is anywhere from 3.2 to $4 billion annually. We're going to get now into the generation mix, and specifically um, policy, and where PJM sits in this entire sphere. So this is PJM's existing installed capacity mix. We're about you know, 180 or so thousand megawatt system. We are a primarily thermal resources based system. Um, combination of natural gas, coal, and nuclear. Our um, renewable portfolio is um, under 10%, I believe it's nine or so percent. Uh, right now, we have historically been, or we were historically, a primarily um, coal uh, uh, regional transmission organization. Coal was the dominant fuel. Um, as of sort of 2005 to today, we've seen that flip from where natural gas was positioned um, to that's where coal's positioning is now. So coal and natural gas have done sort of a flip-flop in the generation mix share um, since um, about 2005, and primarily that is due to the shale gas revolution and increasing regulatory pressures on coal. If we look at Ohio's installed capacity, you know, relatively, relatively kind of similar, primarily a thermal-based um, collection of resources, natural gas, coal, and the two nuclear units, a smaller share actually of renewable resources in the state of Ohio. This is what I was talking about with respect to the fuel mix and sort of the coal to gas switch. Nuclear is held pretty steady over a period of years and you have seen that coal to gas flip from again 05 to today. Uh, you know, this is a slide that we put in the deck to show that Hey, you know, you know, through through the markets that we operate, we've actually seen quite a bit of emission reduction. So, you know, when whenever sort of GHG emissions, you know, SOX, NOx emissions come up, you know, a talking point that you can actually utilize in the PJM footprint is is that just by virtue of um, a combination of technological advance, you know, clearly the shale gas revolution, plus um, markets to allow for entities to try and deploy that R&D has actually resulted in um, significant emissions reduction in PJM over the span of some years. Now this is where things get interesting. So this is what's in PJM's generation interconnection queue. So what is in PJM's generation interconnection queue? It's a lot of solar. It's a lot of solar, it's quite a bit of storage, some wind, um, some natural gas. Uh, we are seeing a lot of you know, potentially natural gas uprate projects. Um, not a ton of, although there was a recent IRP submitted by Dominion in Virginia to include some new natural gas in the mix, but uh, you know, a lot, a lot of, again, solar, wind, and storage. It actually comprises over 95% of what's in our generation interconnection queue. So as you can see, if we go back to this slide, 
and look at our current gen mix and then look at what the queue holds um, for resources that want to come on to the system, you, know, you can really only derive one conclusion, which is that um, we are going to see you know, a different gen mix going forward. And that's why we characterize sort of that we are in a transition period because we are, you know, while not all of these resources will find their way onto the system nearly, um, still what remains fact is this is what is in the queue. Ohio has a very similar story. So we've got quite a bit of solar, some storage, um, and some wind with a natural gas, again, either facility or upright, I'm not exactly sure what that 1096 is. But Ohio looks very similar to where PJM generally is situated. So, <coughs> pardon me, I'm getting a little cough. Knowing that we're sort of in the throes of this transition, you know, PJM has said, okay, we need to study this, right? Because this is, this is a different transition than just the coal to gas flip. And why is it a different transition? Because it's not a thermal resource transitioning to a thermal resource. This is a, these are thermal resources that are, we are now transitioning to intermittent resources. And so we need to study this along with others, right? We're not a sort of alone in this. There are nine other ISO and RTOs in North America. There is... Um, quite a bit of research out there. There are folks that are, you know, advancing through this transition as we speak. In fact, you know, what I'll say is, is that, you know, not only are we not alone in how trying to figure out how to manage through this transition, you know, fortunately, we've got more time than our other regions. Actually, if you take a look at a report that was just recently put out by the North American Electric Reliability Corporation, it showed that about two-thirds of this country is actually at risk of shedding load this summer due primarily to capacity shortfalls. PJM footprint was not one of those regions. So as we say at PJM, we've got time, but we don't have time to waste. We need to try and figure out how to, again, maintain reliability do it affordably, all while incorporating some of these resources who have the right to enter the system um, into the system. So we've been studying this. Um, we've got three papers that we put out that I think are really instructive, and I'll give you a pretty easy way to digest all of the information that I'm about to relay here. At the end, it'll be the punchline. But we've, we've put out these three papers. Reliability in PJM today and tomorrow is just a sort of, if you wanted to read a level set, very basic, easy to read paper, and I kind of worked with our markets and operations professionals on this, and I said, look, I got a degree in chemistry, but um, I'm not an engineer. Please don't write this like an engineer. Write it so folks can actually digest it and understand it, and it's just the, what are the building blocks of reliability? And so that paper, if you're interested, it's a really good paper to just level set. We're going to spend the bulk of the rest of the time on the middle paper on that slide, which is this energy transition in PJM, resource retirements, replacements, and risks. If you haven't seen this paper or heard of this paper, the conclusions are somewhat alarming. Um, and we don't want to just sound an alarm without solutions, but we are being very vocal about our concerns. So um, I am our policy guy. In fact, at some conference, the head of system planning, um, in an effort to try and recruit young folks to the electricity world, was like, hey, you can even be some policy guy. Look at this guy. So the change, they changed the placard on my door to policy guy, so I should have changed it on the slide. Um, but I do... A lot of you know these types of engagements, and I do a lot of legislative testimony. And so, you know, the information I'm about to download, we we have downloaded to um, via 15 different state legislative pieces of testimony to just inform our legislatures on what our concerns are about maintaining reliability during this transition. So we're going to spend the bulk of our time on that, and I'll hit on the third paper, the energy transition and PJM frameworks for analysis. And we will conclude with a discussion of our three primary reliability concerns. So 
Energy transition in PJM, resource retirements, replacements, and risks. We call it the 4R paper. The, the 4R paper effectively says that due to a few different trends, when you stack up those trends in the aggregate, we are worried about, about a supply crunch later into this decade. We are worried about not having enough watts later into this decade. It's a concern for us and um, something that we should all be concerned about. And here are the trends. If we can go back to the deck. <clears throat> this is the first. The first is while PJM has had relatively flat demand over a period of years, we are expecting for demand to increase across the footprint and even in Ohio. And the two primary reasons are, as stated there, this concept of electrification, as well as data centers. We are seeing a huge proliferation of data centers in the PJM footprint, some of them you know, right here in Columbus, Ohio, and the surrounding areas, They're huge, huge consumers of power. So, increased demand, very simple. Second, we are seeing um, or we are forecasting quite a bit of retirements. So those retirements can be attributed to a combination of you know, policy justifications as well as economic, but you'll see the overwhelming majority here is policy-based. In the paper, in the 4R paper, if you were to take a look at that paper, um, what you would find is we based our policy assumptions on five different policies, three of which are federal EPA-related policies, one of which is a climate-based policy out of Illinois called CJA, the Climate and Equitable Jobs Act, and the fifth is a integrated resource plan that was submitted by uh, Dominion um, in their uh, IRP. Now, I think this 40 gigawatts, so think of us, again, this is about a 180 megawatt system. Okay, all-time peak at PJM is about 166. During the heat wave, I think we were at one high 140s. Uh, the heat wave of just a couple weeks ago, actually, that really strained the grid. Um, and kudos to everybody in this room for helping to manage through that. So we're about a 180 gigawatt system. All-time peaks in the 160, in the mid 160s, uh, and you know we had a really strained grid. Just three weeks ago, we were in the high 140s. Well, we expect we expect to lose 40 gigawatts um, at a minimum. We expect to lose 40 gigawatts of uh, thermal resources um, through the end of this decade. And again, they are policy based. So unless the policy is lifted, you know, we should expect for that 40 gigawatt number to hold steady. If we can go back to the graph, please. And so <clears throat> the other reason why, the other reason why we are, uh, you know, we are concerned about, you know, this and this being a conservative number is that we actually uh, received a retirement notice from a, a very large coal plant in Pennsylvania named Homer City. And so that was actually not in our assumptions in our report, number one. And then number two, the new um, federal EPA, GHG rules, which the, um, uh, the initial rule has dropped. There have been comments that were solicited. We, along with our um, regional grid operator, four of our sort of brethren uh, submitted comments effectively saying, you know, hey, you know, take a look at what's in our queue. Is this really needed, number one, to sort of incent new um, clean energy resources to come onto the system? And, you know, are, are we at all concerned about reliability going forward? Because we are very concerned about reliability going forward, and this will accelerate what could be a premature departure, premature meaning end of your economic, at least useful life. This could result in a premature departure of more resources than we're even calculating. Okay, so this 40 gigawatt number, we believe, is somewhat conservative. And then this is the last trend. So again, we said increased demand, 
a lot of supply from you know primarily policy pushing resources out of the system and then this trend and this trend is pretty alarming actually because look all things being equal okay if we were just looking at watts Okay, we're not looking at type of watts yet. I'll get to that. We're not looking at type of watts. And we're not looking at sort of the physical properties of these resources. Just purely watts, okay? We could conceivably replace those resources that are leaving the system with these solar resources. But the problem is, is that the rate of entry of these resources is actually really low. Okay, so... Um, if you take a look, we've got two different scenarios. We call it the low entry scenario, which is approximately you know, 15,113 megawatts, high entry scenario, 30,610. The 15,000, just so you folks know, the 15,000 was based on historic rates of these types of resources getting through the queue and then actually physically putting steel in the ground. The high entry scenario came from um, S&P Global, um, their estimate. So we wanted to provide two different data points, right? We're not, PJM is not in the business of trying to sell anything. PJM is in the business of performing analytics um, and uh, trying to effectively, you know, explain those analytics to the masses um, and uh, uh, operate a system reliably, cost-effectively, et cetera. Now, <clears throat> what's the, so what's the story with this, right? There's... There is a lot of, there's a lot of tailwinds right now, financially, from a policy perspective, to get cleaner resources onto the system. And the, listen, I want to say this, you know, I go to various venues and I really feel like I just want to play this down the middle, right? The grid is going to get greener. And the grid is going to get greener because all you need to do is look at what's in our queue, okay? And that's sort of fact. And for us, we are in a fuel neutral sort of position, right? We want to be able to operate the grid reliably, cost effectively, I'll keep saying it over and over and over. Um, so, you know, we, we, we welcome additional resources finding their way to the system. We want the watts. But what's happening right now is we aren't getting these resources we're not getting steel in the ground. And, you know, we have certainly, um, you know, we, PJM has had to reform a lot of its own internal processes to sort of change this, the typical of large centralized generating station interconnection to, you know, advancing our processes so that we can now have, you know, what are basically thousands of these applications for small, small developments. Um, finding their way through the queue, and that's and we we have done that. And the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission has signed off on that. We're in the process of, um, you know, really evolving how our uh, our system, um, our interconnection queue system, is going to process applications on a going forward basis. So, you know, PJM has, I would say, ref done its best to recognize it needs to change its processes. It has changed its processes. It's in the throes of doing that, you know, as we speak. But, you know, currently statist the statistics are that even our generation interconnection queue aside, we currently have approximately 48,000 megawatts. It's a lot of power of resources that have found their way through the queue, meaning they have nothing left to do with PJM and we are not seeing them getting constructed, okay? Primarily these, are, um, primarily these are solar resources. And so what are the reasons that we're being given by the developers? They're not obligated to tell us, but what are the reasons that we're being given anecdotally? We hear that there is a, um, a, a very intense supply chain problem right now in the industry. That's one thing that we are being told. We are being told that there is a lot of opposition to siting the facilities, whether it's local or otherwise. Um, we are being told that, oddly, the IRA has had kind of a, um, a counterintuitive financial impact for borrowing in order to get these resources constructed. And so you're seeing a lot of, actually, the utilities that I used to regulate sell their unregulated 
um, sell their unregulated sort of renewable arms because in their words, it's just getting too pricey, right? So, you know, here we are. You know, we are in this position right now where we've got a very reliable fleet. We've got enough watts and we are expressing sort of our concern on a going forward basis that, you know, those dynamics could be changing if we're not able to, um, you know, manage this transition appropriately. So that's the 4R paper. Again, increased demand, a lot of supply leaving the system primarily because of policy, and replacement resources not matching the rate of the supply that's leaving the system, which will invariably create a supply crunch by the end of this decade. Now, I wanna get back to sort of the analyses, okay? And this really is, is when we you know, take all of our analyses and we sum them up, this is kind of where we're positioned. So <clears throat> the first item to talk about is um, Winter Storm Elliott. So I know that uh, Winter Storm Elliott has been discussed already at the conference, was the really challenging few days we had the Christmas period last year. And, you know, I just sort of said this, uh, but, you know, the, currently the system should be very reliable. We've got enough watts. We have enough watts with what are called um, essential reliability services. And remember that three-word um, piece of nomenclature because it's really, really important. So we have enough watts. We have enough essential reliability services. Generally speaking, we should be a reliable system happened in Winter Storm Elliott was that we just, um, we had, we had um, generator performance challenges. Um, in fact, at, a, at its peak during Winter Storm Elliott, we had 46,000 megawatts of generation that just couldn't perform. Uh, and th that generation gave us, um, you know, 92% of that generation gave us um, less than an hour's notice or no notice at all. So if you imagine you're in a control room trying to sort of put the pieces together of a pretty intricate jigsaw puzzle and you know you go to put a piece down and you make the call and they say oh we can't run you know and must mo must have most of that was due to just the concept of winterization winterization within the fence line of the generating unit in fact 70% um, of the outages that we experienced were within the fence line um, and then you know roughly 30% were things like you know, uh, not having dual gas pipelines, not having firm contracting, some of these same gas electric coordination issues that the industry has been dealing with, you know, it's ever since I've been in the industry, um, you know, early 2010s um, going forward. So that's, you know, that's one reliability concern, which is we got a really great fleet today. It's just got to perform. The middle is what we just talked about, that 4R paper, which is we are concerned about resource adequacy. Will we have enough watts to supply 65 million consumers and their businesses you know, by the end of this decade? And then the item on the right is something that I think <coughs> does not get enough attention, but really should. And it doesn't get enough attention because it's kind of hard to understand if you're sort of you know, not in the space. And that's this concept of essential reliability services. And so the North American Electric Reliability Corporation, um, they have, you know, effectively said, here are the physics, physical engineering properties that we need on the grid in order to continue to operate a reliable grid. And currently, only thermal resources, which is um, nuclear, coal, gas, provide those sort of spinning mass essential reliability services that the North American Electric Reliability Corporation says are necessary to continue to maintain reliability for the grid. Now, again, we're happy to have all the intermittent resources, you know, onto the system, but they are not, they do not have the same operational characteristics as nuclear, coal, and gas. <laughs> At least that is, you know, should be understandable. You know, these concepts of, you know, frequency, inertia, ramp, voltage, um, control, all of these things, um, you know, that, that gets a little more, you know, scientific, right? It gets a little more sort of physics and engineering based. But, you know, at a minimum, you know, 
the types of resources that are finding their way into every state. Like every state is very similarly situated to where Ohio is. It just did state legislative testimony in Kentucky, right? Very strong coal fleet in Kentucky. Everything in their queue is a solar resource right now. And so this is where we kind of find ourselves is in this sort of, you know, snapshot in time conundrum space. And so we have boiled down our three reliability concerns into sort of this very simple you know, trio of concerns. You've got the immediate concern, which is we need to support resource performance. Have enough watts, have enough resources with essential reliability services, but we need to support resource performance. We're actually right now in the final stages of revamping the PJM capacity market. It's a three-year forward-looking market that procures resource adequacy for the, fire, for the full footprint. Uh, you know, you have, uh, the co-ops have been represented um, well um, in that process, uh, and they're, again, the discussions are ongoing. You know, whatever comes out of that process ends up getting filed with the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission in what is sort of a docketed proceeding, and that will be the capacity market. But the, re the sort of revised capacity market framework, at least, that we have put forward is meant to support uh, again, resource performance, you know, on a going forward basis. The near-term concern is this concept of ensuring resource adequacy. We talked about this. Will we have enough watts? The long-term concern is this concept of maintaining and attracting essential reliability services. And, you know, here's my advertisement for existing in wholesale markets, right? Here's my advocacy for that, which is that now, if you are trying to take advantage of monies provided in the IRA, or if you are, you know, private equity, which is I know two two uh, you know two words that we hear a lot about now. I just was got off the phone with a friend of mine who's a physician. He's like, "Hey, what do you know about private equity?" I'm like, oh, "Not that much. Worked, you know, worked at a law firm, then government, then you know, what is, what is effectively a nonprofit." And he's like, "Well, this." Private equity guys want to buy my physician practice, and wow, you know that's pretty amazing. But you know, if you know, there's a lot of research and development happening out there. There's a lot of R and D happening out there, and so those folks will want to try and get a return on that investment. And whether that's you know hydrogen or small modular reactors or whatever it might be, um, a little more sort of. Um, they're a little more leveraged financially to take risks, but if they hit, they want reward, right? And if you exist in a wholesale market space, you conceivably get that reward. And so we need to create the right markets environment to both maintain essential reliability services, so compensate our thermal resources for the attributes that they are providing to the system, but we also need to create the right markets environment to attract new resources as well. So, you know, we are not in a position again where we are, you know, advocating for any particular fuel source or type of resource. We are truly analyzing the resources. We are truly analyzing the system based upon the physical properties of the system and trying to create the, the right markets, planning, and operations environments in order to, um, again, maintain system reliability, keep costs affordable. So we're not going to sit on our hands. Um, you know, we are raising flags. I wouldn't call them red flags. I wouldn't call them yellow flags, but we're raising flags. But we're also going to try and lead to take action in the planning, operations, and markets sphere. And so we, as a team, have come up with a series of different actions that we want to take to try and support reliability. Um, we will not talk about, you know, all of these. That upper left is the sort of capacity market. Those acronyms effectively represent the work going on right now um, for the capacity market. And uh, the good news is, is that this is all very accessible. So if you go to pjm.com and you click on, if you look at the bottom left graphic, if you click on that ensuring a reliable energy transition, It'll take you to sort of a web page on pjm.com where it will pretty neatly articulate our reliability concerns going forward. It'll, it'll provide all of the 
papers that we have put out. So all the analytics, all the actual um, scientific backing for our concerns and in the planning markets and operations space, it'll show you the different endeavors that we have underway to try and find our way through this transition. And so you can have that sort of readily at your fingertips to access um, if you want to read more or um, look at some of the actions that we are trying to take. So that's a lot. Uh, we discussed, you know, we discussed quite a bit in sort of the combination of the policy space, but also, you know, the engineering and market space related to the future of reliable and affordable power delivery uh, to the entire footprint. I've got um, about six, six, seven minutes left, and I'm happy to field questions from the audience if folks have them. A couple of screens ago, uh, one of your, I think maybe your busiest screen had on the lower uh, bottom right a tab called Elliott Placeholder, I believe. Yep. Just wondered what that was. Yeah, so that is for any actions that we believe, I'll go back to that. So we recently put out, about two weeks ago, um, our sort of findings of what happened during Winter Storm Elliott. So we put out a report with our findings and then a slew of recommendations. What we need to do is we need to look at those recommendations and see if any of them sort of fall under this preservation of reliability on a going forward basis um, kind of bucket. And that Elliott placeholder will then get replaced by actual sort of you know, critical actions that we feel like we need to take that will also find their way onto the website. But we didn't want to, as we're kind of rolling out this, you know, ensuring a reliable energy transition, you know, we wanted to make sure that we, um, we didn't get ahead of ourselves knowing that there was a report on what happened in Winter Storm Elliott. I think for the most part, and especially through our capacity market reform, um, we feel like we are, we are pretty well situated uh, to, um, to address uh, most of what was in that report. And then the other item, so for instance, there's an item in there for me and my team on you know, uh, trying to ensure that you're appropriately communicating requests for conservation, right? So I'm on the sort of external facing side. You know, does that find its way onto ensuring a reliable energy transition? Probably not, but it's just an action that needs to be advanced as a result of Elliott. So that's a long-winded answer to say, um, we didn't want to get ahead of, out ahead of ourselves before the findings and recommendations from Elliot were um, released to the public. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you for your report. Um, I'm under the impression that the thermal systems uh, that didn't perform uh, during winter storm Elliot would be penalized, uh, but the intermittent systems are not penalized the same way that, that also didn't perform. Is that correct? And is there going to be a change in that? Yeah, so generally speaking, um, the report out from Elliot is that the renewable resources performed to where they were expected to perform for the most part. Now, there are exceptions here and exceptions there. And if they did not perform, that they will be penalized. Um, and it, it very much depends, though, on whether or not they were participatory in the capacity market. And I think that's what you're probably hearing about, which is right now there's a robust discussion happening around whether or not um, intermittent resources must offer into that market. If they offer into that market, then they are subject to the same penalty structure as thermal resources are subject to. But as we sit here today, and it was primarily because, you know, when the last set of market rules was designed around this concept, there were so few renewable resources on the system. And, you know, behind every grand machine are sort of people and lawyers and a federal regulator turning the machine. And so at that time, renewables were not mandated to participate in the market. That could very well change here. But those that did participate, that did not perform, were penalized. Generally, 
Um, Performance-wise, um, renewables, you know, again, performed up to their sort of accredited standard, which is percentages less than what we expect the thermals to perform at, and, you know, sort of their revenue is decreased by that decrement. Um, so hopefully that made sense, um, and I think probably what you're hearing is that renewables are not required to participate in the capacity market and thus not subject to penalties. But um, that could very well change with this capacity market proposal that we've got. A, a lot of your uh, reports concerning to me, but early on you had a slide that showed the capacities of the various um, generation and mm -hmm. specifically it mentioned nameplate capacity. Is there some consideration that the solar and wind can never actually generate the nameplate capacity? Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. So we've, we now have, and I think I was, I started to get down the path of explaining it to the gentleman that asked this question in the back, but we currently have what is, you know, it's a technical term um, called effective load carrying capability. And what we have said is, is that, you know, as a class, you know, solar resources can only, um, are sort of X percent of the highest performing resource, which is typically a nuclear resource. And so um, what does that mean? It basically means that we are sort of creating a decrement for what they can actually recover in the marketplace based upon the actual capacity they can provide. And so it's never, it's, it's not a one for one. And so the nuclear resource will receive, you know, 100% of its, you know, potential capacity revenue, whereas the solar resource will receive whatever it is, 30% for, um, because that's the maximum capacity that they can offer um, consumers, frankly. Uh, and so their ability to perform is, has a di direct proportion to the revenue that they receive. Hopefully that makes sense to you. And actually what we're doing right now is um, we are creating a framework because it only makes sense to after Elliot for all resources to receive that effective load carrying capability. And each resource frankly could be treated differently. I think the natural gas fleet you know, one thing that we have certainly noticed, I'm running out of time here, but one thing we have certainly noticed is that they're, they're very different assets, you know, based upon, you know, whether they have firm contracts, whether or not they um, have pipeline redundancy, and so many other, you know, sort of factors, including on-site winterization efforts. So I think that there's some, some space to do some good work here. I think we've got time for one more, hopefully. You, you talk about reliability and affordability, but you never talk about accountability. And I feel like that's one of the big issues with this whole program that they're shoving down the pike with doing away with with coal and gas. You know, who's when it all falls apart, who's 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 uh, accountable for it? And and you know, that's when there's no one accountable for all this. That's what what do we do about that? It's a great question. It's a really, really great question. It kind of exists in the sort of policy sphere that we operate in. And, you know, our, my boss went to testify at the U.S. Senate on June the 1st. And, you know, he was sort of asked something similarly. And he said, you know, naturally, the accountability will probably fall on us, right? At the end of the day, folks will point the finger at us and say, you know, you failed to keep the grid reliable. And that's all fine and good, but you know, let the record reflect that we are here. We are telling you our concerns about reliability. We are telling you concerns about the, the future of being able to maintain reliability. And in some ways, you know, some jurisdictions are already seeing this collision course, right? California has you know, effectively had the reverse tread on some of its climate objectives and start relying on some of the resources that it pushed out in the mix, right? And, you know, other jurisdictions are dealing with this right now. But certainly I do think that there is a, I certainly think that there is a, um, a balance that should be struck here. And part of that balance is, 
hey, can we, we understand the policy objectives of, you know, uh, in some instances the federal government, in some instances our states, but can we treat this like an engineering problem, okay? Your policy input is, your policy input can find its way into the discussion, but, you know, policy A, policy B, and policy C in our report, all of these were passed without any engineering analyses. And so how are we expected as sort of engineers and, you know, some economists, how are we expected to operate a system like this? And for your consideration, senators, um, and I do this, you know, again, across the footprint, please, when you're crafting energy policy, please think about this as, you know, an engineering issue. And um, please, you know, invite us, invite other knowledgeable folks to the table to try and deal with it as such. And if you need to, create outs and off ramps for yourselves on these sort of, on your trajectory for policy here. And, you know, look, um, you know, again, I don't, I don't want to play resource favorites here. Um, our mandate is very clear. Again, we wanna try and maintain a reliable system. Um, we see an energy transition. It is on our doorstep and it's because of what's in our queue. And we are just trying to call balls and strikes uh, and say you know, what we think will work right now and what we think won't. So that's where we're positioned on this. I enjoyed speaking with all of you. Thank you very much for your time and enjoy the rest of the conference.